This video is brought to you by Surfshark. Safety and security online are critically important. You can protect yourself online with Surfshark. More on them in a bit. During its existence, the Soviet Union was known to take things to the next level. Big boats, huge rockets, giant bombs. One particular industry where they really went all out was the railroad. In addition to developing the 1,524mm Russian broad gauge track that allowed for wider and taller trains than the rest of Europe, they completed vast stretches of railway in the Far East, such as the 896-mile Turkestan-Siberian Railway. In fact, during the Soviet era, freight rail traffic increased by 55 times and passenger rail traffic by 10 times. Before its collapse, the USSR boasted a railway network of almost 92,000 miles, that's 147,000 kilometers, which is second only to the United States. Perhaps the most ambitious example of the Soviet's railroad obsession was the AA-20 steam locomotive, also known as Stalin's engine. The only locomotive ever built with 14 driving axles, the AA-20 stretched a whopping 110 feet, 34 meters, making it the longest rigid frame locomotive in the world until 1939 and the longest ever in Europe. Unfortunately, in this case, the Soviets may have been a bit too ambitious. In the 1920s, the Soviet Union under Joseph Stalin sought to rapidly industrialize to catch up with Western powers like Germany, the UK, and the US. Specifically, Stalin claims the nation was 50 to 100 years behind the advanced countries and said he wanted to close that gap in just 10 years. A planned economy, with the government directing the investment of capital and resources, the USSR developed their first five-year plan in 1928. The Soviet Union was uh, vast, to uh, say the least. It was the largest country by area during its existence, at over 8.5 million square miles, or 22 million square kilometers, almost 5% of the land on Earth. As a result, the nation's resources were often far apart. For example, the Ural Kuznets metallurgical combine needed coal and iron ore to produce steel, but the two resources were situated over 1,200 miles or 2,000 kilometers apart. Plus, the final steel product then had to reach its destinations, most of which were in the European part of the country, where some 72% of the Soviet population lived. The powers that were decided the best way to solve this was with freight rail. However, they didn't want to spend too many resources or too much time developing the railway over other important industries. Therefore, the strategy involved limiting investment in the railroad so that it could just barely meet the demands of industrialization. As you probably guess, the trains regularly had problems coping with the volume of freight on the expanding lines. The railroad was in constant crisis, with numerous failures in the supply line that resulted in production shutdowns. This was further complicated by the fact that there were four distinct groups trying to manage the railway. The Soviet government, the Communist Party, the Goss Plan Agency responsible for economic planning, and the Railway Ministry, MKPS. Some wanted to invest in more trains, while others wanted to completely replace all of the tracks with electrified ones. A less expensive and faster option than building more trains or replacing the tracks, the Soviets finally decided to merely design more powerful locomotives that could pull more freight. This was easier said than done, though, because the tracks and freight cars could only handle so much weight and force. The original Soviet locomotives were rigid steam engines of the 0 and 2 wheel configurations. Based on white notation, this refers to the number of wheels the train has, ordered by non-powered leading wheels, powered drive wheels, and non-powered trailing wheels. In other words, the 2 had one axle of two leading wheels, five axles of ten driving wheels that actually moved the train, and no trailing wheels. Some Soviet engineers wanted to keep these wheel sets, but merely increase the locomotive's power and axle load, but this would have required reinforcing the tracks. Therefore, other experts proposed an alternative adding more wheels. The United States and Germany had previously had success with steam engines as large as 412-2, so engineers looked to those designs. There was still an obstacle, though, which was that these foreign train engines had an axle load of 27 tons. The Soviet tracks could only handle 20, so if they wanted to avoid reinforcing the tracks, they'd have to add even more axles. Thus, the plans for the 414-4 AA-20 locomotive were born. 
All right, now we're gonna get back to today's video in just a second, but first, a quick word from today's brilliant sponsor, Surfshark. Look, Surfshark wants you to get the absolute most out of your internet experience, which is why it provides two fundamental 21st century services, superior security and additional online options. First of all, the security. Look, there are weird people out there on the internet, but Surfshark means that you can stay safe. They've got military-grade encryption and even multi-hop security options so that your IP can be secured from any connection in the world, whether you're traveling the world or just using that dodgy Wi-Fi at the local coffee shop. Worried about geofences or government censorship? Don't be. Surfshark has more than 3,200 servers in 65 countries, so you can live online wherever you like. And then there's number two. More options online. Look, do yourself a favor. Close Netflix, fire up Surfshark VPN, open Netflix, and boom, depending on what location you've chosen, you would get an entirely different Netflix catalog, which is brilliant. Works also with a bunch of other streaming services. There's also a cookie pop-up blocker, an IP rotator, GPS spoofing, an automatic kill switch, and more. And of course, as with any good VPN, Surfshark doesn't keep logs, and they offer a 30-day money-back guarantee if you don't like it, but you will. You can get 83% off right now and three months for free at surfshark.deals mega and enter the promo code mega, or just follow the link below. And now back to today's video. The AA-20 ran into hiccups from the get-go. In 1931, a group of graduates from the Russian University of Transport developed the initial design, which called for a 214-4 wheel configuration. Sponsored by Andrei Andreev, the politician honored by the locomotive's AA designation, the plans were sent to the Krupp Steelworks in Essen, Germany, uh, with orders for two of the locomotives. However, it turns out that even a 214-4 configuration wouldn't be able to handle the weight restrictions of the track, so the incomplete AA-20 was transferred to the Voloshalovgrad locomotive plant in Lugansk, Ukraine, where it was to be finished in the 414-4 configuration. Unfortunately, the Lugansk plant was not very experienced at producing locomotives and was still in the process of mastering the smaller 2102 that had been designed. As a result, construction went so slowly that the NKPS cancelled the order for the second locomotive, settling for the single AA-20 that was finished at the end of 1934. In addition to being the longest steam locomotive at the time, the AA-20 was the only one with seven driving axles in a rigid frame, a distinction it holds to this day. Not only that, but it had one of the largest steam boilers ever used on a European locomotive at 60 tons. This let the steam engine produce 7,200 horsepower, propelling it to a theoretical maximum speed of about 156 miles an hour, around 250 kilometers per hour. Intended to haul heavy freight between Donbass and Moscow, the AA-20 took its maiden voyage on the 1st of January 1935, during which it was supposed to provide publicity for the mega project in the nation's capital. However, its engineers quickly recognized a number of problems. For example, the steam distribution system didn't function as designs, leading to less power and less speed than hoped. More importantly, the train just would not stay on the tracks. It was too big. As a non-articulated locomotive, the AA-20's seven driving axles all remained parallel to one another with no ability to turn. With over five and a half feet, 1.7 meters of space between each one, the locomotive had a rigid wheelbase of over 30 feet. It was too long to negotiate curves and it derailed regularly. Without a redesign, there was no way the AA-20 could help alleviate the USSR's railway crisis. Soviet railway officials tried a couple of ideas to get the AA-20 to pass through curbs without falling off the tracks. The first was to remove the flanges from the wheels on the middle three driving axles. Flanges are those lips on the inside of train wheels that prevent them from moving laterally off the track. Removing them gave the locomotive a bit more flexibility on the turns, but it wasn't enough. The next idea was including universal joints in the coupling rods, the visible rods that connect each wheel and transfer power from the drive. Since a universal joint consists of a pair of hinges oriented at 90 degrees to each other, it allows rigid rods like a train's coupling rods to transmit power while being oriented at inclined angles to one another. In other words, it would give the wheelbase the ability to bend slightly without losing power. These universal joints were installed between the first and the last two axles. These solutions failed to solve that problem, though. The AA-20 kept derailing basically every time the engineers tried to run it. On top of that, it frequently spread the track and destroyed any points that it passed over, the movable rails that can diverge a train from one set of tracks to another. Plus, it was too long to fit on railway turntables, 
and in the stalls at the depots. Worst of all, though, the AA-20 proved incapable of actually hauling any freight because it was too powerful for the Soviet couplers in use at the time, which could only support a maximum 85 tons of coupling weight. It looked like solving the USSR's railway problems would take a lot more than just a big engine. By 1941 and the USSR's entry into World War II, Soviet railway freight had grown by 20 times to 400 billion tons from just around 20 billion in 1928. Unfortunately, though, the AA-20 had nothing to do with it. Instead, the expansion mostly utilized the FD, the steam locomotive with a 2102 configuration that was produced in Lugansk at the same time. In 1935, the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union appointed Lazar Kaganovich as Minister of the Railways to solve the railway crisis. Although he spent much of his time busily purging the railway administration's ranks of saboteurs, he also reformed the USSR's weight transportation strategy by prioritizing bottleneck areas and investing in heavily trafficked lines while more or less abandoning other lines. It was during this time that officials finally admitted that the AA-20 was a fruitless endeavor. No amount of tweaking would make it work. They moved it into storage at the Shipinka test facility outside of Moscow, where it was used for instructional purposes until it was finally scrapped without announcement or fanfare. In 1960. In the end, the AA-20 is considered by most experts to have been a total engineering failure. It was never even used in actual service. One thing, however, must be said. In their attempts to solve a complex problem, the Soviet planners definitely went big. 